My name is Emily, I'm 32 years old, and I'm married to a wonderful guy named Jacob. We live in a small town in Oregon and until recently considered ourselves a happy family. We have a cozy house bought on a mortgage, beloved dog and cat, and big plans for the future. However, in the past year, it seemed like all the misfortunes of the world fell upon us. First, I lost my job, the company where I worked as a marketer went bankrupt. Then Jacob's organic fertilizer business started making losses. Clients disappeared one by one, debts grew like a snowball. We economized on everything, food, clothes, entertainment. But money was still catastrophically short. Our savings were melting away, and I couldn't find a new job. Every day I sent out dozens of resumes, called acquaintances, but all in vain. One evening, sitting in the kitchen over yet another unpaid bills, Jacob and I had a disheartening conversation. M, this can't go on. If nothing changes in the next month, we'll have to sell the house, my husband said glumly, sipping cold coffee. I know, honey, but what can we do? I've searched the entire internet, no one wants to hire. And your business isn't going well. I helplessly spread my hands. We need to decide something. Maybe declare bankruptcy, or ask our parents for a loan. Jake rubbed his nose bridge tiredly. I shuddered. I didn't want to admit our failures to relatives. Especially to my father-in-law, William. He had always been so proud of his son, set him as an example. And now what? He'll rush in with his lectures, reproach us for not being able to stay afloat? Let's wait a little longer. Maybe next week I'll get lucky with an interview. Or you'll get new clients. I don't want to give up before time. I suggested uncertainly. Jacob just sighed and hugged me by the shoulders. We sat in silence, each thinking our own thoughts. An annoying autumn rain was tapping on the window, evoking melancholy. It seemed the whole world had turned against us. A couple of days later, William called us. It turned out Jacob had hinted to his father about our problems. And he, without thinking twice, offered to help. He said he'd come in a few days to discuss the details. I got nervous. William was an authoritarian and categorical person, used to commanding everyone. Even my father was afraid of him when we came to visit. And now he's coming to us. And at such an inconvenient moment. Honey, maybe you should tell your dad we'll manage on our own. It's kind of awkward. We're adults, but waiting for handouts from our parents, I tried to appeal to my husband's pride. M, now is not the time for ceremonies. We desperately need help, you know that. And Dad, he's a man of action. If he promised to support, then he will, Jacob cut off. I had to accept it. After all, extra money wouldn't hurt us. And the awkwardness can be endured. At that moment, I had no idea how this generous gesture from my father-in-law would turn out for me. On the appointed day, William arrived in person. Elegant, fit, with a military bearing expensive suit, polished shoes, dapper mustache. Well, against the background of my homely appearance and Jacob's tired face, he looked like a real gentleman. Emily, dear, glad to see you. You're as charming as always, my father-in-law gallantly kissed me on both cheeks. His cologne made my head spin. At least he didn't bring flowers, or it would have been quite ambiguous. Hello, William. Thank you for coming, I smiled politely showing him to the living room. Jacob hugged his father, and they closed themselves in the office to talk business. And I went to the kitchen to prepare dinner, wondering what surprise William had prepared for us. It turned out to be a whole rescue plan. To begin with, he would pay off part of our debts and give money for the most necessary things. Then, while Jake was getting his business back on track, William himself would pay our bills. And in return, he would temporarily move in with us to, you know, keep his finger on the pulse and control expenses. My eyebrows shot up at this arrangement. What does this mean? We'll now live together, under the constant supervision of my father-in-law? What about personal space, privacy, after all? He'll be sticking his nose into every crack. But there was no choice, we had to agree. William generously gave us a day to pack, and then the great relocation began. Fortunately, we had a spare room where guests used to stay overnight. That's where my father-in-law moved in with his suitcases and trunks. 
At first, I walked on eggshells, trying not to cross paths with William too often. He seemed to have taken the dominant position in the house, rearranged everything to his liking. Dinner, strictly on schedule, watch only the programs he's interested in. And if something's not to his liking, immediately read morals and educate. Jacob just smiled guiltily and asked me to be patient. Saying his father is doing us a favor, sacrificing his comfort. We need to show respect and obedience. Easy for him to say, he's not home all day, but what about me? But there was nothing to be done, I had to resign myself and lay low. After all, William didn't move in with us forever. We'll get through a couple of months, get back on our feet, and politely see him off. And for now, I'll play the role of a hospitable hostess, no matter how difficult this role may be. Gradually, William and I got used to each other. We even, you could say, found common ground. It turned out that behind the stern appearance was an interesting and pleasant conversationalist. My father-in-law had seen a lot in his time, traveled half the world, knew a lot of stories and tales. In the evenings, when Jacob was working late, William and I spent time together. We drank tea in the kitchen, watched old movies, walked the dog in the park. He willingly helped around the house, fixing a faucet here, hanging shelves there. He presented himself as a kind of noble knight in retirement. I was surprised and touched by his attention and participation. William asked about my hobbies, worries, plans for the future. He knew how to listen and support so well that I wanted to open my soul to him. Next to him, I felt like a little defenseless girl being cared for by a wise and strong man. Emily, you have no idea how lucky I am to have such a wonderful daughter-in-law. Believe me, for an old man like me, it's a pleasure to admire your beauty and hear your ringing laughter, William would say, looking into my face confidentially. I would get embarrassed, avert my gaze. It was unusual to hear such speeches from my father-in-law. Jacob hadn't showered me with compliments or surrounded me with care for a long time. Over time, our relationship had turned into a habit, a routine. And here, new emotions, male admiration. William always found a reason to praise me. He liked my dress, or my hairstyle, or my inner world, rich and mysterious. I melted from his charm and gallantry. Sometimes, in moments of reflection, a treacherous thought would coil around me, is my dear father-in-law perhaps flirting? His attention to me is too flattering and selective. He'll take my hand under the pretext of a manicure, or tuck my hair behind my ear. His gaze seems to bore into me, as if getting under my skin. But I drove away such fantasies. After all, William is my husband's father, what kind of flirting could there be? It's me, fool, who's dreaming from lack of communication. I see interest where there is none. I need to pull myself together and not encourage familiarity. Easier said than done. No matter how hard I tried to reduce our communication to a minimum, William always found a way to leave us alone. He'd call Jake to make him stay late, or drag me out to get some air. And when we were left alone, it was as if we were drawn to each other like magnets. The conversations became more and more personal and frank. William complained about loneliness and misunderstanding from his children. He confessed that with me, he felt as if his soul had become younger. That I was the main joy of his old age. I was flattered by his trust and admiration. Gradually, I began to see William not just as a relative, but as a man attractive, charismatic, desirable. His closeness and accidental touches made me hot. My thoughts were confused, my heart was racing. I drove away these desires and fantasies, telling myself it wasn't right. After all, this is the father of my beloved husband, what a shame. I tried to avoid being alone with him, made up errands outside the home. But William, as if sensing my confusion, doubled down. The compliments became more explicit, the touches more intimate. In the evenings, he would move closer to me, cover my hand with his. He would send meaningful glances that sent shivers down my spine. I felt that a little more, and I wouldn't resist, I would give in to temptation. And this thought both terrified and enticed me at the same time. The denouement came suddenly. Jacob left for a neighboring town for a few days to meet with a new client. William and I were left alone. At first, I was going to spend the night at a friend's, but my father-in-law insisted that I stay home. 
saying it's not right for a young woman to wander alone, especially since we have plenty of space. In the evening, we had dinner, drank wine. William was unusually gallant, he set the table himself, lit candles, turned on soft music. Then he invited me to the veranda to admire the stars. And although I understood that this was pure provocation, I couldn't refuse. We sat on a wicker bench, sipping aromatic wine. William was telling a funny story from his turbulent youth, I was laughing, throwing my head back. Suddenly he fell silent and looked at me with a long, piercing gaze. Emily, you don't even realize how beautiful you are. A true goddess, driving men crazy with just a flutter of your eyelashes, William said quietly, leaning towards me. His tone and closeness sent shivers down my spine. I tried to say something neutral, turn it all into a joke. But William didn't let me finish. In one motion, he pulled me close and pressed his lips to mine in a hungry kiss. My vision darkened. For a second, I froze, unable to move. I wanted to protest, push him away, remind him of propriety. But instead, I wrapped my arms around William's neck and started kissing him back. Fiercely, frenziedly, as if for the last time. From there, everything went as if in a fog. Embraces, kisses, feverish tearing off of clothes. We kissed as if we had finally reached a forbidden fruit. William's hands slid over my body, sending waves of tremors. I think I was moaning something, whispering, begging him not to stop. We almost stumbled into the bedroom, tripping and bumping into furniture. We fell onto the bed, tightly entwined with naked bodies. William covered my skin with kisses, whispering something tender and incredible. I arched towards him, going crazy with desire. What followed was a whirlwind of frenzied sensations, blinding ecstasy. Our bodies moved in a single rhythm, merging in a mad dance of passion. My fingers convulsively gripped William's shoulders, as if afraid of losing touch with reality. It seemed that in another moment I would dissolve, disappear in this insane whirlpool. Just a little more, a little more, like that. The peak of pleasure caught us almost in unison. Holding back the screams bursting from our chests, we clung to each other convulsively, like drowning people to a life preserver. And afterwards, we froze, tightly intertwined, exhausted and stunned. There was a ringing emptiness in my head, only echoes of the experienced bliss still resonated in my body. I was the first to come to my senses. I sat up abruptly on the bed, frantically groping for clothes. Panic was slowly raising its head inside. Oh God, what have I done? I slept with my father-in-law, I cheated on my husband. How could I, what came over me? Emily, darling, what's wrong? Come to me, mumbled the relaxed William, trying to hug me by the waist. No, don't touch me, this is terrible, we shouldn't have. Oh God, Jacob will kill me. I babbled in horror, buttoning my blouse with trembling hands. Come on, he won't know anything. This will remain our little secret, William grinned, stretching demonstratively. I felt sick. A secret. This is real betrayal, deception and meanness towards my husband. How will I look him in the eyes after all this? William was saying something, trying to calm me down. But I wasn't listening anymore. Barely fastening up, I flew out of the bedroom, slamming the door. I locked myself in the bathroom, fell to the floor, and burst into tears. From shame, fear, and disgust with myself. What will happen now? How to live with this betrayal, with this burden of guilt? William, of course, won't talk, it's not beneficial for him either. But I will know. Every day, every minute that I betrayed, deceived, fell into the dirt. Shaking and sobbing, I took a shower. To wash away the traces of sin, William's smell, the sensation of his touches. It's a pity that the soul can't be washed white. It is now forever stained with shame and guilt. I came out of the bathroom on shaky legs. William was smoking on the veranda, satisfied and content. He glanced at me, chuckled. Like, why the sour face, darling? You got pleasure, so rejoice. His gaze seemed to burn my back. Lowering my head, I slipped into the room, collapsed on the bed. I burst into loud sobs, burying my face in the pillow. Why, oh why am I such a fool? I fell for a pretty face and sweet talk, 
without thinking about the consequences. Now I'll pay for it all my life. The worst thing was that my body still remembered William's caresses. It languished, craving for a repeat. Even through the veil of shame and fear, treacherous excitement was breaking through. In fury, I pounded my fists on the mattress. No, enough. I'll tear this infection out of my heart, forget it like a bad dream, even if I have to bleed myself. In the morning, William left, citing urgent business. Thank heavens, I didn't have to face him again. The whole next day I walked around as if in a fog. I mechanically cleaned, cooked, stared at the TV. And in my thoughts only one thing. What to do now? Confess to Jake or keep silent until the end of my days? I waited for my husband until the evening, completely worn out. Seeing him on the threshold tired, but satisfied I almost burst into tears. I threw myself on his neck, started kissing him, mumbling some nonsense. Jacob was taken aback by such a reception, laughed. Hey, baby, what's wrong with you? I missed you too, but not to this extent. My heart ached with guilt and tenderness. God, what a scum I am. I betrayed him, tainted our marriage. And he doesn't suspect anything, looks at me lovingly, trustingly. All evening I couldn't find a place for myself. Under any pretext, I clung to Jake, rubbed against him like a cat, looked into his eyes. As if I wanted to beg for forgiveness, erase the sin with carnal passion. My husband was surprised, but very pleased with my attention. At night, lying in the marital bed, I couldn't hold back tears. I quietly sobbed, turning to the wall, biting my lips. Jake got worried, started asking what happened. I wriggled out, said I missed him and got nervous. He kissed me, pulled me close. His warmth and care made it completely unbearable. No, that's it. Enough suffering and torment. In the morning, I'll talk to William, tell him that everything between us is over. I'll nip any attempts at closeness in the bud. And then I'll do my best to mend relations with my husband. I'll be the most loving and faithful wife. And no temptations will knock me off my path anymore. With these thoughts, I fell asleep, determined and almost calm. Not knowing what trials the coming day was preparing for me. William showed up in the morning as if nothing had happened. Fresh, smiling, radiant. As if there hadn't been that night between us, as if we hadn't betrayed our loved ones. Waiting for Jacob to leave, my father-in-law immediately went for kisses. He hugged me by the waist, pulled me close, whispered right in my ear. Well hello, beauty. How did you sleep? Admit it, did you miss me? His self-confident tone made me shudder. I wriggled out of his embrace, pushed him away. My eyes were shooting daggers, my voice trembling with anger. Listen, William. What happened between us was a mistake. A terrible, unforgivable mistake. A moment of insanity. It will never happen again, do you understand? My father-in-law raised an eyebrow in surprise. He smirked unpleasantly, crossing his arms over his chest. Oh really? So you used me and threw me away, huh? Well, thanks for that at least. But keep in mind, you won't get rid of me that easily. You wanted this yourself, you seduced me. So don't play the offended innocent now. I was speechless with indignation. I seduced him? How dare he, that scoundrel? As if he didn't see what he was doing to me, what speeches he was making. And now, apparently, I'm to blame for everything? Are you out of your mind? What seduced? What are you talking about? You're old enough to be my father, you're my father-in-law, for heaven's sake. How dare you accuse me? You messed with my head, took advantage of my weakness. I choked with anger. William just laughed an unpleasant, grating laugh. Unpleasant sparks danced in his eyes. Oh, come on, Emily. Don't pretend you didn't like it. You were moaning under me, arching your back, begging me not to stop. How exactly did I mess with your head, I wonder? With kindness, attention? Your hubby doesn't give you that, he's busy with his career. And I appreciated your beauty, your passion. I awakened the woman in you. You're ungrateful, you know. I was shaking with fury and humiliation. I wanted to claw William's face, scratch it bloody. I had never heard such blatant obscenity. 
How dare he accuse me of anything? I'm the victim, and he's the vile seducer. Enough, that's it. I don't want to discuss this anymore. It's over between us, William. Period. You will leave our house today. And I will try to forget this nightmare and never remember it, I hissed through clenched teeth. My father-in-law narrowed his eyes, looking me up and down. He snorted condescendingly. Well, well, we'll see. Just don't think you'll get off easy. I won't give up so easily, just so you know. I'll fight for you till the end. And then, we'll see how the cards fall. With these words, he turned sharply and left, slamming the door. And I sank powerlessly onto a chair, clutching my head in my hands. God, why is this happening to me? Why did I get into this mess? Why didn't I listen to the voice of reason? Well, never mind. This is just the beginning. I'll cope, I'll manage. I'll endure this trial, make amends to my husband. And William, I'll banish him from my heart, eradicate him, burn him out with a hot iron. He won't appear in my thoughts and dreams anymore, not now, not later. It's easy to say, of course. But to do. William kept his promise, he really fought for me. That is, he didn't leave me alone for a minute. He called, ambushed me, sent ambiguous gifts. He even whispered something to Jake about my alleged coldness. I was holding on by the skin of my teeth. I fought back, snapped, avoided meetings. I lied to my husband that his father was just worried about me, like a daughter. In reality, it was much worse. William seemed determined to get me back into bed at all costs. He didn't shy away from anything, neither blackmail, nor threats, nor vile hints. Saying if I'm not compliant, he'll tell Jake everything. He'll describe in vivid detail what a whore his wife is. And how sweetly she moaned in her father-in-law's arms, forgetting about her husband. I froze in horror, curled up into a ball. I begged him not to do this, not to destroy my family. I promised anything, money, favors, silence to the grave. Just so Jake wouldn't find out, just so his heart wouldn't be broken. William grinned maliciously, licking his lips. He demanded proof of my loyalty. He whispered all sorts of nasty things, inflaming, stirring up my imagination. He said that only with me did he experience real passion. That I was made for love, for carnal pleasures. His words made me hot and cold. I hated myself for how my body responded to his calls. For melting at just his voice, melting at his touch. Some part of me was tearing towards William, craving to repeat the madness of that night. But I held on. With my last strength, out of sheer stubbornness, I held on. I didn't give in to provocations, I avoided my father-in-law like the plague. At night I cried into my pillow, biting my fists. I prayed to God for one thing, let Jake not suspect anything. Let this cup pass us by. My husband really didn't notice anything. William played the loving father, the caring relative in front of him. He sucked up, fawned, created the appearance of participation. And he himself was slowly but surely destroying our family. Such duplicity, such cynicism didn't fit in my head. How can one be so inconsiderate of his son's feelings? To spit on his happiness, treacherously take away his wife. I couldn't find words to describe the depth of my disgust for William. And you know what's the most disgusting thing, even realizing what a scoundrel he is, I continued to want him. My body betrayed me, ached and burned from just one glance. In particularly difficult moments, I was ready to climb the walls with desire. To forget about everything, to send principles to hell. To fall into the abyss of passion, dissolve in it, forget myself. In such moments, only the thought of my husband kept me on the edge of the abyss. Sweet, kind, unsuspecting Jake. Loving me more than life, endlessly trusting. No. I can't betray him. I've already done enough, no need to take more sins on my soul. The denouement came suddenly. One evening, Jake returned from work gloomier than a thundercloud. He threw his jacket in the corner, collapsed on the couch without looking at me. I anxiously sat down next to him, tried to hug his shoulders. Honey, what happened? You're not yourself. Maybe you'll tell me. My husband slowly turned to me. Pain and fury mixed with confusion were splashing in his eyes. He clenched his fists so that his knuckles turned white. Emily, 
Just be honest. Answer as if under oath, don't lie to me. You have a romance with my father, don't you? It was as if the ground was pulled out from under my feet. My head spun, nausea rose to my throat. Oh God, has everything been revealed? But how, where did he find out? W what? Where did you get that, what romance? Jake, listen, I have no idea. I stammered, trying to avert my eyes. But my husband didn't let me finish. He jerked up, loomed over me like a threatening shadow. His voice rang with fury and anguish. Stop lying, Emily. Do you think I'm a complete idiot? Blind and deaf. I immediately noticed how you and father were cuddling in the corners, how he undresses you with his eyes, how you blush and pale in his presence. I just didn't want to believe it, drove these thoughts away. And today he told me everything himself. Can you imagine what a surprise? My knees buckled. William confessed to Jake. What kind of person is he, if he's capable of such meanness? To trample his own son into the dirt, to trample on his feelings. Oh, darling. Forgive me, I beg you, forgive me. Yes, it's true, William and I had, an episode. Just once, I swear. It won't happen again, never. Please, don't leave me, give me a chance to fix everything. I burst into tears, clutching at Jake. But he shook off my hands with disgust. He recoiled as if from a leper. On his face, revulsion mixed with pain. What episode, Emily? You slept with my father, what kind of excuses can there be? How could you, how did you even dare? To betray me, us, our love. God, I'm even disgusted to look at you, he shouted. Each of his words hit me in the gut, cut to the quick. I was shaking with shame and remorse, tears were rolling down my cheeks. I wanted to sink through the floor, to vanish, to disappear. Forgive me, Jake. I don't know what came over me. It was a delusion, a weakness. I didn't want to, really. Your father, he seemed to hypnotize me. He surrounded me with attention, affection. And I, fool, fell for it, melted. I thought he loved me, that I was special to him. I babbled incoherently. My husband laughed bitterly, heartbreakingly. In this laughter were pain and disappointment, the bitterness of betrayed trust. Loves. He's only loved himself all his life. He seduced you for a momentary whim, and then sold you out. He claimed that you were throwing yourself at him. Crying about what a bad husband I am, don't understand your needs. So he took pity on you, comforted you. Bastard. Jake angrily kicked the coffee table. Then suddenly he seemed to deflate, hunched over. He sat back down on the couch, hiding his face in his hands. His voice trembled, sounding tired and desperate. What have you done, Emily? How are we going to live now? I trusted you so much, loved you so much. And you? Eh, what's the use of talking now? My heart was breaking with pity and guilt. God, what a scum I am. What a selfish, hysterical woman. I destroyed everything with my own hands, betrayed the person closest to me. And now I'm sitting here, blubbering. When I should be begging for forgiveness on my knees, crawling at his feet. Jake, darling, I'll fix everything. I'll throw William out of our lives, out of our thoughts. We'll start all over again, I promise. We'll forget this nightmare like a bad dream, we'll live on. Just don't leave me, don't abandon me. Give me a chance to prove my love. I pleaded. My husband was silent for a long time, looking at me with an impenetrable gaze. Anger, pain, and love were fighting in him, it was visible. Finally, he sighed heavily, shook his head. I don't know, Emily. I don't know if I can trust you again. Live with you, knowing that you shared a bed with my father. I need time. To be alone, to think. Maybe divorce is the way out. Or maybe I'm just a coward and a weakling. Right now I don't have answers. One thing I know for sure, I'll kick William out today. Enough of him mocking our family. With these words, Jake got up and left the room. I remained sitting, crumpling a handkerchief wet with tears in my hands. There was a ringing emptiness in my head. It seemed that everything had collapsed, my life, my love, my hopes for happiness. But no. It's too early to give up, too early to drop my hands. I brewed this mess myself, 
I'll have to deal with it. I'll fight for our marriage to the last. I'll beg Jake for forgiveness, I'll regain his trust. Whatever it costs me. Resolutely getting up, I went to look for William. I found him in the backyard, smoking, squinting at the setting sun. Seeing me, he grinned, raised an eyebrow. Ah, my dear daughter-in-law. What, came to beg for mercy? Beg, maybe I'll soften up. His self-satisfied tone made me shake. Flying up to William, I slapped him. My voice was dripping with venom and hatred. You. What a scum you are. How could you do this to us? Seduce me, and then betray Jake? Destroy our family, trample his faith in his father? You have a stone instead of a heart, you're not even human. William rubbed his cheek, squinted. A flicker of annoyance passed through his eyes, but was immediately replaced by his usual self-satisfaction. Oh, as if I dragged you to bed by force. You jumped in yourself, even said thank you. And as for Jake, it was high time for him to take off his rose-colored glasses. You're not his match, he'll realize that yet. A beauty like you is made for a better life. With me, for example, he grinned. I shuddered with disgust. This is William's true face, a cynical, lustful animal, knowing neither shame nor conscience. And I almost put this person above my husband, above my own dignity. Listen to me carefully, you bastard. Today you pack your things and get out. Let your foul spirit not be here, got it? And don't you dare trouble Jake and me any more. don't you dare stick your nose into our lives. Otherwise, I swear, I'll destroy you. I'll tell everyone what a scoundrel and villain you are, I hissed. For a moment, fear flashed in William's eyes. But he immediately pulled himself together, stretched his lips in an insolent smirk. Well, well, try it. But keep in mind, I can tell such things that it won't be funny. I'll describe in detail how you moaned under me. How you begged me to fuck you harder. Do you think Jake will like that? I doubt he'll forgive such a thing. So I advise you not to twitch and behave yourself. In impotent rage, I clenched my fists. What a bastard, ready to do anything just to spite. But no, enough. He won't push me around and blackmail me anymore. You know what, William? I don't give a damn about your stories. Everyone already knows who you are. A vile, cynical seducer, a destroyer of families. You're trying to intimidate, to trample into the dirt, but it won't work. Because my conscience is clear. Yes, I stumbled, made a mistake. But I admitted it and I'm ready to pay for it. And you will wallow in shit all your life. A pathetic, unwanted old man. Having blurted this out, I turned around and proudly left. I felt William's stunned, angry gaze on my back. But I didn't care. I had made my decision. That same evening, my father-in-law left without saying goodbye. I think he understood that I wasn't joking. That I won't allow him to manipulate and push me around anymore. The choice has been made, the point has been set. Now we need to live on. Jake and I were recovering for a long time after everything that happened. We were healing emotional wounds, learning to trust each other again. I admit, it wasn't easy. My husband couldn't fully forgive me. I saw how sometimes alienation, bitterness flashed in his eyes. How he involuntarily winced at the mention of William. But we didn't give up. We went to a family psychologist, worked on our relationship. We talked a lot, spent time together. Gradually, everyday life was getting back to normal, the former tenderness was returning. Every day I proved my love to Jake with actions, words, attention. And he thawed, softened. He looked at me already without the previous pain, but with warmth and sadness. Of course, we will never be the same again. That story will always stay with us, like an unhealing scar. But you know, I've learned to live with it. To accept what happened, not denying or writing it off. Yes, I stumbled, made mistakes. But I admit them and want to correct them. And this is already the first step towards forgiveness. I sent William a Christmas card. With a single phrase, I forgive you. And it's true. I forgave, for everything. For the deception, for the betrayal, for taking advantage of my weakness. But to forgive doesn't mean to forget. And certainly doesn't mean to let him back into my life. 
Let him live as he knows. He'll find a new victim, destroy a couple more families. That's on his conscience. And I have my own path now. Next to a husband who loves and forgives, despite everything. And I will cherish this love till the end of my days. That's the story, friends. Bitter, painful, but very real. About how easy it is to stumble. To be flattered by a beautiful rapper, to fall for flattery and persuasion. To make mistakes in the heat of the moment, without thinking about the consequences. But what's more important is to be able to admit these mistakes. To gather the courage to say, yes, I'm guilty. Yes, I'm ashamed. But I want to make amends. And a lot depends on whether there's a person nearby ready to give a second chance. To extend a hand, to embrace, to comfort. Because, in the end, it's love and forgiveness that hold this world together. Value what you have. Cherish those who love and understand you, despite your mistakes. Don't chase after illusory happiness on the side, don't look for thrills. All this is just tinsel, glitter. Real treasures are always near. Protect them. With this, I'll probably finish. Thank you to everyone who listened to me. And let my story serve as a lesson to you. Make you think about what's really important. Be attentive to your loved ones. Don't betray, believe, forgive. And may love and mutual understanding always reign in your homes. Take care of yourself and the people dear to your heart. With love, Emily. Did you like this story? Let us know in the comments what you liked. Subscribe to our storytelling podcast. Also, don't forget to like and ring the bell so you don't miss more interesting stories. See you soon.